Yeah, no, so yeah, I've always enjoyed the heat, and I really do enjoy the motif you got going on back there. You got birds, you got cacti, you got, it, it's good. I, I dig it, so. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, you know, the thing about London, I actually, the only time I've ever been to London was after 9 11 one I had a flight that was supposed to go from Paris to Kansas City, and of course, everything ended. Oh. I was in Venice in the back of a water, a water taxi. Somebody was shooting their arms up, telling me that America was under attack. And I finally had to make my way back to London. I got out of Gatwick and the English were so good. It was, they were so welcoming and, and kind. And I mean, you know, I mean, there was, there was a lot going on and people were cognizant that America was going through this thing and they just weren't quite sure how the bin Laden thing and all this thing transpired. Anyways, it was, it, it was a good experience. So good. I'm, I'm uh, glad I'm glad we helped to the bat moment. Yeah. Well, and I need I I like London, but I need more sunshine. It reminds me of Seattle. Like I can't have that many, you, you know. <laughs> no, no, you don't have to explain. It's like being in Tupperware. It's just yeah. horrible. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, hey, Liz, it's great to meet you. And before we get into your life, you know, we were talking a little bit about 9-11 and calamity. We just went through three years of COVID. How did you survive that time period now that the world's waking up? And how has it changed the way that you live your life and conduct business now? Well, the pandemic. Yeah, getting through the pandemic now that we're kind of entering this post-pandemic period. Right. So um, my business actually thrived hugely yeah. during the pandemic. I'm, I'm a business coach. So everyone's business needed help. Everyone had to rethink a lot of stuff, a lot of strategy. So I actually worked like a demon right the way through. I know a lot of people went very quiet. Uh, my life exploded, which in some ways was fabulous, but it, it did make me a tiny bit bitter because the whole world was out there baking banana bread and learning how to make soda bread. And I was just working yeah. like a demon all the time, which um, was annoying, but I did help a lot of people and that was lovely. But the big change for me personally was that um, for the 10 years prior to the pandemic, I was completely nomadic I worked from wherever I felt like I moved around and I was coming in from I've been living in Budapest for quite a long time then I moved to Mo and a long time is nine months for me then I moved yeah. to Malta for the winter because it was nice and warm and I was coming back through London just to visit my sister um and the the world was sort of shutting down and I remember saying to her I may be here longer than three weeks <laughs> and I'm still here in London three three years later and wow. she is still being remarkably nice about it I might add well there you go a lot of victories right there so let's get to the exactly. essence <laughs> let's get to the essence of what you do for a living I'm going to hypothetically put you in front of a bunch of grade school kids at a career day third graders and one of the kids looks up and says hey what do you do for a living how do you answer that child so most businesses are quite difficult to run in the adult world. It is tiring, it is stressful, and people react without making the best decisions. And my job is to help people work less, earn more, have more fun, and to just generally feel great about their business. So how did you get to this point where you are this person that people go to to help them get, get things figured out? My background is in film. I spent 20 years producing um, visual effects, so lighting effects within like big Hollywood films, which means that you are working with multi-million dollar budgets, like hundreds of millions of dollars worth of budget. And you're working with big teams and everything is like incredibly stressful. And everyone has this beautiful, big, clear wonderful vision that they want to achieve and a thousand small parts that have to fit together to make that work which is it remarkably like how entrepreneur life is you have a big vision you have a million things you need to do you want to help people and make something beautiful how do you fit it all together so it sounds like it was a strange move but it was actually incredibly similar because the things that happen in the film industry we are always, always screwing up, frankly, in the nicest possible way, but things go horribly wrong. And you're always course correcting, you're always fixing that. When I first started working with entrepreneurs, um, people would be flawed by things going wrong, which I, it, it surprised me because I'm like, well, yeah. yes, of course they did. That, that's right. life. Things go wrong. What are you going to do about it? Because in film, the only thing that matters is how you deal with a disaster. So something's gone wrong, what do you do next? You're only as good as how you managed the last thing that went wrong. 
Yeah, that's interesting. I remember years ago, a good friend of mine who lives in Germany now, he does documentary films, and I worked on a film, and it was a two-day project. It was here in Kansas City, and it was like two days of like nine hours, maybe even more. It was the most exhausted I've ever been in my life, and it was. It was all about pivoting, stress, and getting into it. And of course, I've been trained as a journalist and been in this world, and and I understand those things, but man, there's a different thing, because then you got big inflated egos, you got all these personalities, you know? You got people that think they're way bigger than they are. There's some people that are just humble. I mean, you got all these different things, but you have to stay in your lane to a certain degree and keep it moving, you know? Exactly, exactly. So. But the, the big thing is that you've got those lovely goals that you're all aiming for. You're all clear. You're all pulling in the same direction. Yeah. And that's part of what's great about coaching because you're there to assist someone else's goals. So where were you born and raised and how did these seeds get sprinkled in you, not only for this fascination with film and design, but to become who you are to help people as a coach now? So I was born in Dublin um, and my family, my father's an engineer and he worked all over the world. So I grew up through my teenage years. We grew up in Pakistan and in Nigeria. So that feeling of like a global world where people are doing exciting and interesting things, but it's hard and you have to deal with it. That's always been there. And before he worked in one place, my father went to sea, he was part of the merchant Navy. So it was perfectly normal for someone to wander in and go, that's it, I'm off to Nigeria. And we all go, mm, right, <laughs> fair enough. Yeah. So um, travel and running businesses and working hard has always been part of my life. So who's been a hero for you in your life? Mm. Well, my mother, sounds a bit trite, but my mother was a head teacher at a primary school in a very deprived area of Liverpool. And she made sure that everyone left her school. So at primary school, people are there till about 11 years old. She made sure that, sure, that every child that left that school um, could read, write and do basic sums. And she didn't think that was a big thing. That was just, this is what I'm here for. I'm an educator. This is what I'm here for. And it was only right at the end of her life, she realized quite how exceptional that was that many schools don't even achieve basic literacy. But she was lauded for it. It was very lovely. Every time I hear Liverpool, I just, you, know, you can't get away from the Beatles thing. <laughs> <That's> true. <laughs> so how, how do they memorialize the Beatles there? Is there some like museum? Do they have statues? What do they do in Liverpool? Well, they've named, they've named the airport after Lennon. Okay. Um, and they have some very bad statues. Like really, truly Ugh. appalling nasty bronze things but um there is uh, i think there's beatles experience that's not good it's not good kids you know what's weird is that kansas city is where walt disney came to so he was in marceline which is north of us a couple hours came here for the art institute mm -hmm. and had a studio and then of course it it failed and he went to florida okay and then it started this dynasty but you can see the side of the building painted and Kansas City hasn't done anything with it. Like, how can these places like Liverpool that has the biggest band that ever, ever, ever came out on the planet not capitalize on that in some big way? And I keep thinking about that with Walt Disney. I mean, this was a seminal moment for him before he went on and did all these things. And we don't have anything going on. It's so weird. You definitely should. Yeah. So, so let's get to... You know, you've probably seen a lot of things in the realm of film, but I'm curious if you can meet anybody on the planet right now and spend some time with them, who would it be? Who'd you love to meet and talk to? Ooh, I would love to spend um, an evening chatting to Margaret Atwood. The way her mind works. Yeah. Fascinating. The way she's brought together feminism and an awareness of politics. And in fact, she's really blossomed in the really late stage of her life. She's written and wonderful books and wonderful poetry for years. And she presumably made a living from it, but it's really since the Handmaid's Tale series came to it, she's won the book. It's like, she's amazing. It, and she's really good fun. That's that. It is wild how that works. There are a lot of authors where, you know, they, they get to that point late in life and all that starts happening and it's, it, it's wild. Um, so let me ask you this. What is the motivator for you? What is the fire? What is the gas in your tank that gets you to want to help people and to do what you do? Oh, you're coming with the big questions. Yeah, so I, this <laughs> this is therapy session. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's nothing small here. No small talk at all. So big talk. Um, the the 
simple answer is I like helping people. I think that's really important. Um, and I think every coach has that. But for me, running a business is hard. And people don't talk about quite how hard it is. Um, so I create small mastermind groups where people can turn up and think about their business. There are very few places where you can ideate. Really just think. Your family, your friends, your loved one is probably sick to death of you talking about what you do and how it works. They care. They want you to do well, but they really aren't interested in exactly how sales are going in this particular quarter. Whereas I create these little spaces where people can think through an idea properly, where they can turn up and say, you know what, this month, it's just hard. And likewise, they can go and celebrate the small things, the things that no, no one else cares about. I've got my new sales page up. Everything is fantastic. I am 2% up on last year. The stuff that is small, but super important. So I, I do that because I believe that one of the things that as a human you can do for someone else is to hear them. Not just listen, but truly hear what they're saying. You don't have to necessarily agree with them, but to just say, that's tough, or, or yes, I know what you're talking about. That is a really special thing. And that's what I do for my entire life. Sure, I help people grow their businesses. Sure, that has a trickle down effect, which means lots of families and lots of people are going to do better. And the people they serve are going to do better as a result of it. And that feels nice. But it really comes down to on our darkest, toughest days, it is really lovely to have somebody say, yeah, I hear you. And that's what I do. You know, I do a lot of jazz radio and, you know, of all of the things that I've ever heard about Miles Davis is they say that he listened really well, you know, like people would give like he had this like ritual where if he listened to something, he'd like had a boom box and a tape and he really honed in. And that was the whole nature of the Miles look. He would sit there and listen and watch and just, you know, because a lot of communication, 80 percent of it's nonverbal, you know, I mean, there's a lot of it that goes into the way that we are. So let's get to a story about business that people do want to hear. What's been one of your best success stories? So I'm, I work with coaches and designers and copywriters, people that help. <laughs> terribly sorry, terribly sorry, there's a very loud motorcycle going past outside. That's um, fine. So I, help... I love ambient noise. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a lot of it here. I apologize. <laughs> so um, I help people that help their clients make decisions so that it's it's that particular genre of people I work with um but getting going on that like with any business can be quite hard you have to build your group so I have a client who when I first worked with her she hadn't hit the magical 100k ba um, barrier she wasn't making that yet which for a coach particularly in North America it's, it's like that's the amount you want to make so the first year we took her to 100k the second year she made the same amount but only working three hours a week so fantastic so a tiny bit of stuff and the year after she did all of that plus an extra 100 150k um so it just and the lovely thing for me is that people think it's like a like a big secret but it's head trash that mostly stops us from doing stuff mm -hmm. so i helped with all of that and she sent me this wonderful little text message that just said i don't know what you did to make the internet back the money truck up into my business but <laughs> i know it happened in masterminds it's amazing so that's, for me it's that stuff yeah that that's cool so as somebody that worked in film obviously you're fascinated with it what was the first film for you that you you saw and you were like wow that's something i want to do someday hmm i don't know about the first one but the one that's influenced me most is rear window that whole setup is the storytelling is superb the, there's a whole bunch of um, just insights, those tiny little stories within a story. That for me feels like that has the most direct correlation for what I do now, because that's how bringing groups of people together for coaching. It's like those little moments where you see the, the, the dancer with the fridge and the guy with the little dog, all of that stuff. You're bringing it together into a co coherent whole. So I'm going to go back to what I was saying about going through London and that trip that I had in Europe. I started out in Paris and I went to a, an exhibit that was happening at the time, a Hitchcock thing. And I walked into a room and there was like 40 glass cases on pedestals and a light shone down. And it was all the props, the scissors from Psycho, the phone from Dial M and all of this stuff. But it was a whole exhibit. 
and it was about how he used illusion and he worked with Dali and he really did go out of his way. He was really a master of, of all that. And I think about that movie too. And the color at the time was so crisp, like Coppola kind of ripped the page out of that book because there's so much that goes into the way your brain processes all of that. It's amazing. Oh, completely, completely. It's um, every little detail goes together to the big story. It's gorgeous. Yeah. And, and, and it's all meticulous. Like none of it's by accident. That's why it's so cool whenever you can really read into something that you love, how much effort goes into it. Just like you said, like sometimes I'll just sit at the end of the movie and watch all the names go by. And I'm like, my God, how, you know, it's like, there's just all of these names and everything had to come together for this massive thing, you know? So it's amazing. So as you look back on your life and all of the things that you've lived through, if you have a dream tonight, run into the 20 year old version of yourself, you could give that version of you a piece of advice based on the wisdom you've gained in your life up to this point. What would you tell that young version of you? Hmm. 20 year old me. Calm down. Calm down, love. It's going to be okay. It is fine. Um, I used to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I was convinced that to work hard, you had to work super hard to get anywhere. And you do to a certain degree. But I went out to work in the film industry and oh my Lord, I proved to myself that that was absolutely true. Everyone else was working even harder than I was. And now I work three to four hours a day, four or five days a week. And I, I earn, forgive me, and my younger self, I earn considerably more. And it's like, I wish I'd known I didn't have to work that hard. Yeah. Yeah. So at this point in your life, what are you the proudest of? Actually, right now is the fact I do only work three hours and three hours a day. Oh, come on. That's pretty good. Yeah, absolutely. So everyone out there has a perception of you, family, friends, clients, colleagues, but you are in control. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? I'm a pretty nice person. And, you know, sadly, for most humans, just actually genuinely believing you are a likable, lovely person is quite rare most of us have to do a, quite a bit of inner work to get to that but yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very very open and i like myself so, so I, what I, would, I, I no, that's great that's a great answer so what would be one of the films that you worked on that you just holds a very special place to you that maybe somebody out there would watch and and wait for your name to come across the credits what film would that be oh you see i normally don't talk specifically about the films I worked on due to the fact that nothing ages like effects films but yeah. I worked yeah. on the second the remake of the Poseidon film which is a terrible film I don't recommend anybody sees it it's an <laughs> awful film but gosh we did some beautiful work on it you really couldn't tell it was nature identical and for me that was the work I loved that was so gorgeous your eye would just pass right over it um so oh, it pains me to say that would be the thing I'm proudest of but oh Maybe. Oh, yeah. Okay. So what would be the film or genre that's going on right now that you would love to work on that you see and you're like, wow, that's stunning. That's stunning. So um, I work, um, what I used to do specifically was I built cities, nature identical cities that you couldn't spot, totally real stuff. But the films that I would normally work on are things like the Marvel films, like huge, like hundreds of millions of dollars worth of stuff and that's fine but you all know it's in there so it's the smaller art films the films that are beautifully edited where you don't really think about the fact that it's set in the 18th century and if you looked across Paris actually there'll be a whole bunch if you film that now there'll be a lot of very tall buildings well someone's taken that all out and made it look perfect but you don't notice it because a bad visual effect will take you out of the story but when it's done well you don't even question it and yeah. that's the stuff I love to do. That's fascinating. So if anyone out there wants to hire you, learn more about you, anything pertaining to your world, where is the best digital door to open up? Well, if you go to rethinkcentral.com slash your name, you will find. So if you go to rethinkcentral.com slash Joe, you will find um, a bunch of free resources and you can email me and get in touch and join my list and all of those things from there. Wonderful. So I, I got to tell you, speaking of like superhero things, to this day, I still have people freaking out thinking that I'm Robert Downey Jr. or I'm Iron Man. They always stop and they're like, 
are you Tony Stark? I'm like, no, I'm not that guy. But I did. I, I went to a hotel uh, about four years ago. And the gal that was working at the hotel was so freaked out. She went up to the room and and threw a letter underneath the door and said, I feel like I did when I was younger. I And, and just like totally freaked out. And it's like, I, so maybe someday I'll talk to Robert and say, look, we, we're doppelgangers. So you do your thing. I'll do my thing. And we'll walk, we'll look out for each other. So it's wild. Perfect. Yeah. That, you know, it's funny. I, that's how I went to Europe for the first time. I went to Italy. I had a pen pal in high school and her, she's totally obsessed with Robert Downey Jr. This is way before anything. And that's, that's, she goes and meets him. Like, I don't know how that works, but she always has pictures with him. Like she's always at the premiere. He knows who she is. And I, I don't know how that works, but it's wild. It's crazy. So I guess there's just people that do that. They just follow people around and that's, that's what they do. So, um, Hey, this has been great. Thank you for opening up. Thank you for your story. Best of luck with everything. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Take care. See ya.